We were looking at a real-time analysis during the diphtheria outbreak that started last year in the Cox Bazaar district um, of Bangladesh and the impact that that modelling had on our operational decision making at the time. So Sid touched a little bit on the context. Um, between the 25th of August and December 2017, more than 600,000 Rohingya had fled from Myanmar into uh, the Cox district of Bangladesh with around 455,000 of those settling in one massive, what is called mega camp. Um, for those of you who've been involved in, in mass displacement, it's not like any other refugee camp you've ever seen. It doesn't have any site planning. It was just a massive amount of people that settled on a relatively vacant plot of land in a rural area. So it basically looks like a slum in a, in a rural area and they completely sort of overwhelmed the, the host uh, farmers that, that were settled in the area. Uh, between the 10th of November when the initial diphtheria case first presented and the 9th of December over 440 suspected diphtheria cases came to our MSF facilities and unfortunately the very first case was misdiagnosed on their first presentation which is not to be, um, it's not a really big surprise considering not very many physicians actually have seen diphtheria anymore. And on one day, we saw on the 9th of December, we saw 168 of those cases in one day. Um, and due to that massive number presenting in one day and having no idea how this would pan out because there's been so few diphtheria outbreaks in the last 100 years, MSF approached uh, the London School to help forecast the, the scale of the diphtheria outbreak. So this is to show you a bit of the timeline of this whole endeavor. So as Kate said, it started early November, had this sudden rise, and then we got involved from the London School. And within those initial days, we started to try to understand what was going on and set up a model, actually, which uh, on the 12th December was ready to give a first, to issue a first forecast. Then on the 14th of December, there were MSF and other partners in the field that took a decision on the number of beds they needed in a diphtheria treatment center. Uh, then we issued three other forecasts. And in uh, early January, there were this diphtheria treatment center was handed over and other centers opened, some run by different MSF sections and some run by other, other NGOs and partners. Uh, and we stopped forecasting at that moment, but the, out, the outbreak, the actual outbreak, still run after that, this and is actually now still running on a much lower level, I think. Uh, just to go through a couple of assumptions. So we got data with location and age of the number of patients per day. So we split our population into to geographical areas, which is Kutupalong in the north and Balukali in the south. And in this initial phase, we, we only had information about patients in those areas. Uh, we split into three age groups, and we assumed initial susceptibility of 80% in the middle age group and lower susceptibility in the other age groups. Um, as you probably know, in many of those outbreaks, between the symptoms presenting and the uh, and, uh, case being reported, there is a delay, which in this case, in the beginning, could have been up to 20 days, uh, and then stabilized between zero and five days somewhere later on. So for us, before trying to forecast anything, we needed to know how many cases do we have at this moment, which because of this delay was not so easy. So this is retrospectively the number of cases as seen in January. And this is the cases we see within, within the first day. So this means that if I take this blue dot on the 15th of December, this is how many cases we know about 
as of the 16th, but there is all those others, which we don't know yet, okay? So we tried to adjust for this, and in the beginning, over-adjusted, and then started to get it to get into the right, uh, the right uh, area, also when uh, this distribution stabilized. Okay, now the real forecasting. So on the left side, I'm showing the number of cases every day. On the right side, the resulting number of pets as presented by the model. And on the 14th of December, they took this decision that 100 bats were needed uh, just as a reference, okay? Uh, our first forecast was quite high, so uh, 300 or over 300 cases per day on average with their high uncertainty. And as a result, a lot of bats needed. Then sorry, we got some more data, adjusted the forecast, got new data, adjusted the forecast again, and you see that as we move along, our forecasts got better, and then go on until in the end we have this first peak, this first wave, and this was the moment when it was handed over. Okay. So concluding from the model, we can say that starting on the 20th of December, our second forecast could give a reasonable the idea of the scale of the outbreak. We have uh, a basic reproduction number of between five and 10, which means that one person infected can infect five to 10 others in a completely susceptible population. Um, around 5% of cases, according to our model, got reported. The epidemic was sustained, according to the model, by the middle age group, five to 14 years. And one very important point for me is that the communication between the modelers here in London and the field has to be very good in order that this works very well because, um, because uh, we have to know more than just the data of what's going on to understand. Okay. So what impact did this actually have on our day-to-day -day operations? Um, First of all, bed capacity. Uh, in the end, uh, we ended up turning what was a maternal child health hospital that had not yet fully opened uh, into a diphtheria treatment centre. Um, but at the time, uh, we only had so many beds within that that could treat patients. So we decided to have a community-based model for those patients that were mild and uh, could be treated on oral drugs. And basically that was, it was not ideal in terms of infection control, we did health promotion around uh, household uh, isolation, but um, given the sh sheer numbers that, that not only we were seeing but that were also forecasted and, and came to be the, the case, we decided that those cases that were moderate to severe would need to, to have those beds that were available to us at the time. Um, as we moved further on into the outbreak and other actors started to come in and, and increase bed capacity, we were able to take on a few more of those cases that were, were moderate and could potentially go either way and, um, and increase our staffing and give them um, the diphtheria antitoxin, which at the beginning was in a global worldwide shortage. Um, it also helped us in terms of forecasting how much of the antitoxin that was needed because at the time, the Bangladesh diphtheria outbreak was not the only one happening in the world, it was one of five. So there was Bangladesh, um, Yemen, uh, Haiti, Venezuela and then Indonesia happened at the same time. So you had massive demands on a very, very small supply of, of antitoxin. Um, and originally we were able to get 200 vials into the country, uh, which is roughly around 50 patients being treated. So there were multiple issues around also deciding which of those over 100 cases a day we were seeing were actually going to have access to the antitoxin. 
it also had an impact on supply in general, uh, how much of uh, everything from your medical consumables, your, your PPE through to your antibiotics do you order, especially because uh, in Bangladesh, we were unable to have erythromycin, which is the main antibiotic of choice previously as our treatment option here. So we had to go for uh, another macrolide, azithromycin, which has very little evidence around the efficacy of that in diphtheria, um, and then forecast based on the amount of cases we were seeing. And it also had a massive impact on staffing numbers. So it forced us to not only recruit more local Bangladeshi staff for case management, but you're also looking at massive amounts of community volunteers to partake in health promotion, contact tracing. Um, we ended up doing a surge support of international staff as well, purely for hands-on case management, um, which had a, a massive impact on the number of staff that we were managing and uh, seeing in the field. And I think importantly, one of the things that, that the modelling helped us with was our advocacy and uh, engagement with external actors. So um, at the time, we were able to use this uh, together uh, with WHO and go on to mobilise the, the resources that they have. So uh, through them, we were able to get more epis out to have a look at the outbreak as a whole because what we were seeing was only a small, relatively small geographic section of an entire peninsula which ended up being affected and we would, did not have the capacity to respond to the entire outbreak. Um, they also uh, mobilised other actors, Samaritan's Purse, um, the UK medical teams. So it was uh, very much they were able to use it internally as well. Um, to, to get those resources allocated to Bangladesh and also to negotiate with the, the Ministry of Health and the various authorities in Bangladesh to open up and, and let them come in. So it was the first time that for a brief window um, the medical uh, registering board said it is okay for foreign doctors and nurses to come in and provide hands-on patient care without being registered with us. Um, it also highlighted for the vaccination strategy um, that it would need a much broader age group. So there was lots of discussions around up to what age should we vaccinate. I still think that we should have vaccinated beyond 15 years, but um, unfortunately that was the, the highest we could get in terms of the age group. And it also highlighted the vaccination status of this population prior to coming into Bangladesh. Because to have a massive outbreak like this, where so many different age groups are affected, really highlights the lack of um, vaccination that they have received previously. Um, so these are just a small group of everyone who was involved in the diphtheria outbreak. And I really would like to thank not only our entire team on the ground and uh, together between all of the MSFs, so to speak, there's more than 2,000 national and international staff responding, um, but also uh, obviously the London School and then WHO, Gorn and all the other actors that came in to respond to the diphtheria outbreak. I think it really was one of the, uh, the, the highlights to see how well we can all come together at a moment of sheer chaos. Thank you very much.